قبل از تبلت آف ویزیتیشن آف افرور با حالت باز چندت
Without being able, or at least I couldn't grasp the kind of person he was. But I feel closer to it now when I am with Dr. Abbas and Dr. Muhammad Ahmed because they have the same spirit, the same feeling, the same gentle, loving tenderness that we always had when we were with Hassan Banyuzi. He was a sweet, gentle, beautiful person. He was a true Afnan. And you know we come across the word Afnan in the prayer book now and again without having a, a real feel for what that means. I think now we will know. I think we've had a, a beautiful taste of it today. I remember one time at one of our meetings at Baji asking Hassan just how he got to be an Afna. <laughs> and he said, well, he said, I was so, 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 I was related to this one and that one. Well, I said, you know, I'd just love to have a record of that. Would you mind writing it out? So, Hassan being Hassan, always willing to, to do anything to help anybody, he started in to write. And he had a pad. Now, Dr. Ahmad has given us his family tree, but Hassan wrote out for me three or four times as much as this. <laughs> and just what it was he wrote, I don't know. <laughs> and I didn't intend that he should go to such trouble. But he, he was the kind of person who just worked, and he did. Now, the only tragedy about it all is that I don't know where my copy of that tree is that he wrote out. I suspect that my wife pinched it. <laughs> Whenever I'm looking at a course or a talk or something, I look around desperately for my books and I find that Audrey has quietly put them away someplace. <laughs> but at any rate, friends, you are now in the presence and you have had these delightful talks from these two Ashnans. And I personally just that I'm in the presence of Hassan again. And he was one that we all loved. I remember every morning when we were in our conclaves at Baji, and the first year there were 26 of us, and then year after year it got down a little bit to 22. But we would meet every morning in the shrine of Baha'u'llah, and we would pray. And Rahi Hanum would always point one of us out as we went in, and she would say, now, John or Harry or so-and-so, you read the tablet of visitation of Baha'u'llah today. And that was a thing we all liked to be chosen to do. And she was able to make sure we all we all got the job at least once during the, uh, that conclave or the next one. And, uh, and there was that beautiful feeling uh, of, of that uh, tablet of visitation of Baha'u'llah and then prostrating ourselves on the ground, on the snow. And then that powerful, powerful prayer and the presence of us all being there. And then we would go to our conference chamber in the mansion of Baha'u'llah. And we would work all day. And in the evening, um, 
perhaps six o'clock or so, we would all go into the bedroom of Baha'u'llah. And that was a room that the, uh, the beloved guardian didn't want it changed. It was the only room that didn't have any electricity in it. So he said he wanted that room to stay just as it was when Baha'u'llah was there. And so we would go in there, and Baha'u'llah's bed was a big mattress on the floor, about center, over to the wall, close to the end. Beside it, there was a little wooden table, and beside, on top of it was a, a, a coal oil lamp. And Rehana would always be the first to go in, and she would light a match and light that lamp. And then the rest of us would come in. And then we would end the day with perhaps a half an hour or longer of prayer. And those were very special times. And I remember the, the feeling uh, when uh, Pastor Benuzi prayed. Um, uh, he was different from anybody else. He was quite different. There was a quality about, about him. And now when we read his books and see what his life ended up in doing, in writing his books, which will last forever, so always have those, those beautiful books that he worked on for the last several years. And so I'm just reminiscing a little bit. And this is brought about by my feeling of absolute joy at having Dr. Muhammad and Dr. Abbas um, Afnan with us. And I just wanted to tell them that they were very glad to have it. They came. And we hope that they will come again another day. Do you agree with that? to speak about Hassan Bayouzi in relation to um, another institution in which he played a very important part. And I'm going to tell you about it. But before I do, I feel that in this room there must be a number of Baha'is who have only been Baha'is in the last few years, the last, say, several years. And so in order to not be talking about something you, you perhaps don't know anything about, I'm going to go back and give you a little history uh, <clears throat> of the past so oh, many years, just touching a little bit on this one subject in which uh, Hassan Bayouzi was very much involved and did wonderful work. I'm going to go back to the year 1921. Don't think there are many of you who were in the faith at that time here. But that was the year when our beloved master, Abu Baha, died. And Shoghi Effendi, his grandson, became the guardian. And from that year, 1921, until November 1957, Shoghi Effendi was our guardian. And he was under the infallible guidance of God. And I want to talk a little bit about this infallibility. Because I think that there may be many of you who don't really understand what that is either. And in fact, I wonder if, if many of us here do understand what infallibility is. And just in case you don't, I want to mention just a little bit about that and say that um, back in the time of the Bob and Allah and Adabaha and then Shogi Hende, um, they were under the infallible guidance of God. 
in their decisions, in the things they did, in the things they built. They were guided by God in everything they did having to do with the same. Now, you may not understand that, so I will give you one or two examples. A favorite one of mine is the fact that one year, uh, Shogun Sandy was very anxious to build a temple on, Mount, uh, on, the, on the, the River Nile. And so he wrote to the National Spiritual Assembly of Northeast Africa and asked that assembly to find a property upon which we could build a temple. So they went, and he said he wanted it within so many miles of Cairo and on either side of the, the river. And they did this. They went up and down and up and down. They couldn't find a single spot. And so they wrote to the Guardian and said they were disappointed. They were heartbroken because they couldn't find a place and they had to disappoint him. And so Shuki Effendi cabled back, persist, love, Shogi. So they, uh, they started over again. They went up and down the river and they had a real estate agent and they couldn't find any place. And finally they cabled again and they said they were heartbroken, but there was no place, absolutely not a spot. So Shogi Effendi came back. And what do you think he said this time? <laughs> he said, persist, love, shogi. So they started all over again. I think they, they appointed a new committee. And they, <laughs> and they, got, a, they got a new real estate agent. And they went, I think they even got a canoe. But they went up and down that river. And finally, this new agent said, well, you know, there just, there just isn't any, any place at all that we could give you. But there is a place that does answer the requirements. It's just that wide and that deep and so on. It has one drawback. And because of that drawback, I wouldn't sell it to you and you wouldn't buy it. So these fellows said, well, what's the drawback? Well, he said, this property is a way underwater. <laughs> and so they looked at the map, and then they looked out at the spot, and there was nothing but deep, deep water there. And they said, well, it answers the requirements to some extent. We'll, <laughs> we'll send this to the guardian and, you know, let him decide. So they did. And to their surprise, they got a cable back Buy it. <laughs> Love Shogi. So they bought it. And you know, there were some years I knew it was there, but I didn't tell anybody. <laughs> I didn't even tell my wife. <laughs> now, this indicates a lack, a little lack of faith on my part. But nevertheless, uh, there you were. We had this beautiful spot. But way, way down to feet. <laughs> so, it just happened, the very next year, General Nasser, who was then the, the uh, premier, the prime minister of uh, Egypt, he, wanted, he decided he wanted to have a scenic highway built right down the River Nile. And so we got all the, the road building equipment and the, everything, and they started plowing and digging. And before you knew it, that property of ours built way up. <laughs> and it made a beautiful spot for a temple. And we hardly paid anything for it. Now, friends, um, I could tell you more about that, but that generally is what infallibility is. <laughs> I remember on the National Assembly in Canada, one thing the Guardian gave us in our first seven-year plan, it was a, no, our first five-year plan, that we had to have some Baha'i on Greenland. 
and there was no way of getting out to Greenland, no way at all. <laughs> and we inquired, and we were told that Greenland was the property of um, uh, Denmark. Denmark. <laughs> And it was a closed country. You couldn't get in, and if you were in, you couldn't get out. It was closed, absolutely closed. There's nobody was allowed in. And we inquired about this. And we had done quite a lot of inquiry. And finally, one time, we had a, a letter from the beloved guardian saying, um, you're doing great. You're, you're fine on the, uh, the assembly work and in the pioneer work and so on, but you seem to be making no progress at all on Greenland. And so we wrote him and said, well, dear Shogi Vendi, there is no chance of doing anything on Greenland. They won't let us in, and those who are in, they can't get out, and, and there's nothing we can do. And then the guardian wrote us and he said, all you have to do is take the first step and know that God will help you with the other steps. Well, you know, that, that still applies. Just take the first step in anything, any of our teaching work, goal work or anything else, and God will do the rest of it. So, we went back to Shogi Thandi and said, Dear Shogi Thandi, we find it hard to believe, but we're going to go do what you say. And so we wrote a letter to a girl in uh, Copenhagen. Oh, I can't remember her name. Do you remember, Audrey? And uh, she was a pioneer from the, from America, the United States, and she'd been there about six months. And she'd gone over there to work on the ten gold countries of Europe. And we wrote to her and asked her if she could help us to get into Greenland. And she wrote back and said, thank you for the compliment, but I can do nothing. She said, I've been here for six months, and really I, I wonder why I came. I don't know anybody, I don't speak the language, there's nothing I can do, and I ask you, please, pray for me. <laughs> so we took this up to the NSA and, and we really went to work to pray for her. And the very funny thing was that soon after that, uh, we had a letter from her saying that a strange thing had happened. She went out of her apartment one afternoon and she met a, a woman who appeared to be ill. And she went to her and found that this woman really uh, needed something. And she asked her if she could help her, and she said, well, if you just give me a cup of tea. So <clears throat> she took her into her, her apartment and gave her a cup of tea, got to know her, and got to like her, and talked to her. Well, you'll never guess who that woman turned out to be. She turned out to be the sister of the wife of the governor of Greenland. <laughs> Well, I happened to be going over to Europe the next year, and I wrote to her. Her name was Elsa Thiemann and she was she was quite a gal, and uh, a fine Baha'i. She became a Baha'i, a very devoted one, and she knew everybody in the government because of her sister in Copenhagen. So she had it all arranged for me. I had the red carpet treatment. I met three very nice men in the in the uh, Greenlandic department, and they told me, they said, you know, Mr. Bart, we just love to, to you know, to get you in, we get some buy in uh, to Greenland, but it's absolutely impossible. Well, there's no way we can do it. It just cannot be done. We're sorry, but it can't be done. Well, I didn't say anything, but I felt like saying, well, my dear friend, you don't know so you think. <laughs> But I knew Shoghi Effendi, and I knew something about infallibility. When he wanted something, he, he knew it was there. And all we had to do was to take the first step. We had a meeting that night, and Baha'is came from many different countries around there, and there were 45 or so, and I told them the story of how we met Elstathim Boyanson and how we were so anxious to get in Greenland. And there was one young lad there, he said, oh, he said, I can get in. 
And to make a long story short, he got it, and our goal was complete. And all we had to do was take one step and so on it went. Well, now, now that is infallibility. I wish I had time to tell you some more, because there are some beautiful stories on this subject. But at least you know what that is, because I'm going now into the second part of this uh, uh, talk of mine, where infallibility comes into it. Um, the guardian, uh, before he died, just before he died, he wrote a letter to the Baha'is of the world. It was his last final letter, written within a month of his death. And this was to the Baha'is of the world. And in it, he, um, he called for many things. But he called for us to have um, uh, five conferences, five transcontinental conferences, one in Kampala and uh, uh, Chicago and uh, all different places, any up in Jakarta. Uh, but there were five of these around the world. And then it was in that last message that he named his final contingent of hands of the cause. And in that contingent, Hassan Bayouzi was one. And he mentioned the fact that he was an Athena. And so we were all very happy about that. But uh, then we no sooner I happened to be in that final contingent of 8-2. And Bill Sears was in it, and, and uh, oh, people you know them all. I hope. Um, the next thing we did, the Guardian died. That letter was in October. He died November the 4th. And we went to London to his funeral. And after that, um, and by this time, there were 27 hands in the world. And uh, at the funeral, there were 26. There was one person, Corinne True, of uh, Lumet. Uh, was not able to go. She was almost 100 years of age, so she didn't she didn't get there. But uh, the 26 of us went on to Haifa, and from Haifa on to uh, Baji, and here's where we had our first conclave, and we had that uh, which lasted for three weeks, and then we had them every year, uh, generally in October lasting for perhaps two weeks, sometimes closer to three. But the very first thing we had to do um, when we all assembled, and here we were, 26 of us, suddenly, with the message from the Guardian, in which he had named us, in which he had called the hands, he said the hands are the chief stewards of the embryonic world commonwealth of Baha'u'llah. So that was written right into that message. I know a lot of the hands didn't know. Perhaps Rehanim did, I don't know, but, but um, I think most of them did, didn't know. And so we had to figure out what that was. And so there we were, realizing the guardian had died, and we had learned when nine of our members were appointed to go into the guardian's office to search his papers to find out if he had left the will and if there was a second guardian and what we had to do and what he meant by this chief stewards of the embryonic world of Commonwealth of Baha'u'llah. We didn't know. So there we were. Uh, seated around this big rectangular table, the 26 of us, and the first thing we realized was that, that some of us spoke English and some of us spoke Persian, and the Persian, most of the Persians couldn't speak English, and I think none of the English could speak Persian. So we were stuck. And it was then we learned 
to our joy that Hassan Bayouzi was fluent in both languages and so was Abu Fazi. Fazi and Bayouzi. They were the only two who really could carry through this terrible job of translating for all of us. Now here's where I come to a little place that I'm not too sure about, but I'll tell you what it's all about. And that is that um, um, as we sat around this table, um, and we would sit all day long for three weeks, you know, sometimes I meet friends of mine who who complain when they have to meet for two or three days in, a, in an assembly meeting or perhaps a whole evening, and they find that terribly strenuous. But just let them have to meet for three weeks with 26 people, all you know, speaking different languages. It's quite something. And then it was November, it was very cold in that room too. We nearly freeze when it got on towards the latter part of the afternoon. So, um, um, but usually he would get up and he would listen and then after a time he would translate it all back to us in the other language. And then uh, he would do that perhaps for an hour. And then things he would take his turn and he would stand up. And I can see them now, one after the other, just standing there, folded arms, taking it all in, and giving it all back. Now, I want to tell you that I have told this story a number of times. And here's the wisdom in, the, in our chairman saying that he didn't want any taking done because some people can make mistakes when they're giving a talk like this because... I know that in telling this story, I have said that Belusi would stand there for as long as 20 minutes, and he would take it all in, and then he would give it all back in the other language. And he would do this again and again and again, 20 minute intervals. And, uh, uh, I have said that I, I went to one of the the other the hands who spoke both languages and said, Look, how much are we getting of all this? And he says you're getting it every word. There's nothing missed. These men know how to translate. Now I had a feeling just three weeks ago, knowing I was coming to give this talk here today, I phoned an old friend of mine and an old friend of yours, Bill Sears. I said, Bill, you know, you know that business when Feiji and uh, Bayouzi would stand up and translate for about 20 minutes? He said, 20 minutes? And I said, yes. I think was, oh, no, no. Five minutes. <laughs> I said, oh, no, Bayouzi, you, you just don't remember very well. <laughs> well, he said, John, you're crazy. <laughs> for 20 minutes. <laughs> well, I said that they have to because I've been telling people that <laughs> for several years. <laughs> and this presents a certain difficulty with me because Audrey so often accuses me of embroidering my story. <laughs> I never embroider a story. <laughs> now, I'm just going to let you decide whether it was five minutes or twenty. <laughs> and I think the person who's got to correct these tapes has got a job. And how he's going to find it out, uh, find out I don't know. But I'm going to say, don't phone, phone Bill Sears, because he doesn't know. <laughs> Well, anyway, um, that, that was, uh, this was one of the things that Banyuzi 
was so very valuable to us. For, and he would do this, whether it was five minutes or twenty, I don't know. But he really, uh, both of them, both the Fasian and the Jews, he would stand there all day long, taking turns. And uh, we got all the translating. And it all worked very nicely, except that there was one time when uh, one of the hands were caused. And I think I'd better not give you his name. It mightn't be fair to him. But he complained that he wasn't getting it all. And he, he com complained quite a lot about that. And he said, look, you're going too fast. Uh, I, I'm not getting it. And I've got to make decisions based on what I hear that comes out of that man's mouth. And uh, you've got to slow up so I can get it. And then, um, do you remember Mr. Mr. Samandri? Dear old Mr. Samandri. <laughs> he, he said something. And everybody, at least all the Persians, roared laughing. <laughs> and so after that meeting was over, I went over to, to my one friend who could speak every language. I said, what was it that uh, Savandri said? Oh, he just said, oh, don't worry about it. These aren't the words of God. If I get one word in four, that's good enough for me. <laughs> This will give you an idea of, of the kind of thing that Badusi was doing. And um, he, was, he was always very sweet, very loving, and very capable. I, want, I wrote to a friend of mine who knew him well, and uh, she wrote back, Telling me a few things about him. I must read, read bits of this letter to you. Uh, incidentally, this letter was from a girl who, whose name used to be Una uh, Townsend, the daughter of uh, George Townsend, uh, and the cause George Townsend. He died some years ago. But uh, um, he, was a, he was a wonderful person. I wish I had time to tell you about George Townsend. At any rate, Una was her father's secretary. And if it hadn't been for Una, the last book of Townsend's, uh, Christ and Baha'u'llah, would never have been written. Because she, she came in and she sat at his deathbed for weeks, and he could hardly speak. She could hardly hear him. But she got it down. And the book came out just about the time of his death. But now, that is Una. And Una is living in Canada. And uh, so I, I got hold of her uh, to get some ideas about uh, Hassan because she knew him. Uh, uh, Hassan was the uh, chairman of the National Spiritual Assembly of the United, uh, the United Kingdom of Great Britain. And so this is what she said about him. She said, he was a quiet person who liked to stay in the background, but was always brought to the foreground because of his vast knowledge and his interesting way of telling us about the faith and its history. He told us things about the letters of the living and the Baghdad period that I've never seen in print. Perhaps they are in his new book. When he spoke, you could hear a pin drop. There was always a good feeling when he entered the room, and everyone smiled. We all felt his beautiful spirit. Someone remarked, whenever I, w I wonder what I should do about something, I always say to myself, what would Hassan do if he were in my shoes? In those days, he had little boys, three, then four, then five. The only time I ever saw him ruffled was at a summer school when there was backbiting. He said that if it didn't stop, the summer school would have to be closed. He was chairman of the NSA of Great Britain for a long time. Shortly before our beloved guardian passed away, he and John Faraday were made hands of the cause. He was brought up in the faith in Bombay, where his parents were pioneering. We heard a lot about this this afternoon. At 15, he decided to be a Muslim, 
because it seemed to him unreal that his first cousin could be as described in the Roman Testament of Abba Did you know that? <laughs> and later he went to Haifa to meet his cousin, that is surely attended, and seemed to him the, the greatest proof of the truth of the cause. One reason he went there with lots of questions, but his mind went completely blank when he met Shogi Fendi. However, unasked, the guardian proceeded to answer each one of these questions. Hassan's mother was an Atna, I think a sister of the guardian's father. Hassan's father was the son of an Iranian ambassador. So, so that's that letter, and that tells you a little bit uh, of Hassan perhaps in addition to what we have, we've had the joy of hearing this, this afternoon. Um, uh, now, um, um, there are so many things. Um, um, when we our first conclave on that day when we first realized that we had to have translations and Benuzi and Fengzi stepped into the breach and did it for us, that was the first day when we realized what the guardian had meant when he referred to us as the chief stewards of the embryonic world commonwealth of Baha'u'llah. And here we were, all of a sudden, um, with this responsibility thrust upon us, for which none of us were prepared. We had no idea what this meant. Probably Rahi Hanum may have had an idea, because she had been his secretary and his wife for 20 years. And suddenly, here we were, 26 of us, and we realized then that we had to uh, manage the affairs of the cause in the absence of Shogi Vendi, without his advice, without his guidance, without him. And so then we worked out all the things that we simply had to do. Now, the reason I told you that about the infallibility is that I must make the point that here we were without any infallibility. We, the hands, who by now are the chief stewards of the faith, um, we had no infallibility at all. And uh, uh, it was quite a thing for us to suddenly realize that, that, that this was the case. And so, we, uh, we, uh, we talked about this, and we realized then, and do you know that at that time, we had had 111 years of infallibility. During the missions of the Bab, Baha'u'llah, Adwah, Shogunani, add all those up and you'll get 111 years, we had this marvelous, beautiful infallibility where we could depend on everything that came. The low center. And then suddenly we were bereft. We didn't have it. And here we were, 26 of us, trying to figure out what the guardian really wanted us to do as his, his chief steward. So, um, um, we then realized, with, to our great joy, that the Universal House of Justice, when it was brought into being, it would have infallibility again. You see, we didn't have it then, but we knew Baha'u'llah had promised that the Universal House of Justice, when it was created, when it was brought into being, it would be under the direct, infallible guidance of God. So this was a tremendous thing. 
for us to suddenly realize that we only had five and a half years to go, and we were then, we were then in the middle of the guardian's ten-year spiritual crusade. You see, he died in 1957. The plan in, in November, the guard, the plan had been given to us in, 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 in Rizwan in 1953. So we, had, we were halfway through the plan, and we realized the first thing we had to do was to complete the plans of the guardian. We had to complete that five-year plan. And that, as we looked at it, was an amazing thing to do. We didn't think there was a hope in the world of doing it. One thing we had was in Latin America we had to have 22 national spiritual assemblies. 22. And at that time there were, there were some countries that didn't even have one local spiritual assembly. And then we had to have 11 national spiritual assemblies in Europe, and we didn't have, oh, some countries there didn't have even one local assembly, and it just seemed impossible. But our job was to, to keep in touch with all the Baha'is all over the world, get them all working, inspire them, as the Guardian had done all those years before, to rise and to go out and teach the faith. And this wasn't easy. And we didn't know at that time whether the Baha'is of the world would support us in this or not. They weren't, they, they weren't accustomed to not having a guardian. And so we, we made many decisions. One was we had to complete the guardian's plan. The, the other thing, and I think perhaps one of the wisest things we did, was we decided that first conclave that we must follow the, the thinking of Shoghi Hendi. In every decision that came up, we would say, well, what does Shoghi Hendi do in this case? And we had many, very different cases. We, we, we appointed our, our nine members of the hands of the Holy Land, nine hands to stay there, and assigned all the other hands to various uh, continents uh, around the world. And we started in then to, to, to inform our friends and to try to figure out how we could guarantee all these plans to be completed. And there were a lot of other plans, not just those national assemblies that had to be brought into being. But so all this is what we had to do, and this was the institution of the... Of the the uh, chief stewards of the embryonic world, uh, the Commonwealth of Baha'u'llah. And this is where our friend Hassan Benuzi played such a, an extraordinarily important part. And it is really to tell you about him doing that that I have uh, started to, uh, to tell you the story. But there are many other angles to it. Um, 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 oh, um, I don't know of which I have a whole list of things to say that you might like. One was, there was one hand who was a darling, who was just a beautiful, lovely, wonderful person, and that was Millie Collins. Then he died about the age of 93, um, before, just about the time the house was brought into being. Incidentally, we got through uh, to 1963. That was the year when we found we could bring in the, uh, the uh, house. And uh, uh, we consulted with Shoghi Fendi's lawyer, and we found that that uh, everything was in absolutely wonderful shape. Sometimes people say to me, you know, Shoghi Fendi really was wonderful, wasn't he? But he did um, 
die without a will. You know, they kind of hold that against him. Well, you know, the, the thing is, that that's all he, he could do. Uh, had we left a will, we'd have paid millions of dollars in taxes. But you see, he didn't own a penny. He had millions of dollars of property, of money in his name. But it didn't belong to him. He didn't have any money. Now, his wife, um, Rihanna, um, she was a Maxwell, and there was lots of money in that family. So she didn't need any money, and they had no children. So he didn't need to leave any money to his wife. And he didn't need, need to leave any money to anybody. And so that, that was made clear, and we just got her, we just had to pay taxes. Because there was no, no tax, he didn't leave any money. And you pay taxes on money you leave. And uh, uh, so all, all this sort of thing. And people were expecting there would be a second guardian. I remember when when uh, I went to the funeral from uh, from uh, Rhodesia, Audrey took me to the train and she said, give my love to the second guardian and tell him that I love him and I'll serve him forever. And I, that's the way I thought, the way a lot of this stuff. And we expected there would be a second guardian. And you know, in those days, before the Guardian died for years, we, the Baha'is, would sit down together and talk about this, that, and the other thing. And one question that would come up so often is, who do you suppose would be the second Guardian? Well, you there must be one. must be a second Guardian. How could we get along without one? And then, suddenly, we realized that when he died, and there was no will, which there couldn't have been, and, that, and there was no second guardian, there were no children. And instead of the second guardian, he appointed the hands, the chief stewards of the embryonic world, and the wealth of Baha'u'llah. And we carried on until the House of Justice came into being in 1963. You see, and that is how the guardian, um, Married the whole thing. And we had a very capable, very able lawyer in Haifa, who had been his lawyer for some 20 years. We consulted him, and he told us all, he gave us, he gave us the whole picture, and we could see how wise Shoghi Effendi had been in everything he did. And he was, he said, beautifully wise. And so, uh, Now, friends, uh, I'm getting to the end of my time, and uh, there's so many things I would like to tell you. Um, yes, I'll tell you about Millie, Millie Collins. She was, uh, she was the first, the first hand. Oh, yes, there's just 15 minutes left. <laughs> How do you spell 15? Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, Millie Collins. Um, she was the first uh, hand appointed with a guardian. He appointed her in 1947. But he told her, he said, this is just for you, Millie. Don't tell anybody. And so she didn't. And it wasn't known until four years later. But Millie just loved Shoggy Fenty. And she was very well off. Her, her husband was a mining engineer. He left her lots of money. And... Uh, uh, she went and lived there and wanted to give all her money to the thing and gave quite a lot. But the guardian said, Millie, you must be a good, a good stewardess of that money. At any rate, uh, uh, when he died, and we had our first conclave, uh, Millie was the one of all the hands who didn't seem to really be sad. The rest of us were just looking hard to have no guardian. He died. He's gone. But Millie was... And she was the one who we thought would just be broken hearted. And I remember I said to her one day, I said, Millie, I hope you don't mind my, my saying it, but you know, you're the only one of us who really isn't sad. And why, well, how do you account for that? Do my, sorry to ask you this, but why aren't you sad? <laughs> well, she said, she said, I couldn't be. 
she says, you know, every year, the guardian and Rene Holland used to go to the mountains in the summer, and in July, and they would come and they'd say goodbye to us all. And, uh, and when he'd come to me, he would say, now, Millie, you will, um, you will look after my cables and see that I get my mail and so on and so on. But this last time, she died in London. He didn't come back from that trip. The last time, he came to me and he just looked at me and he said, Millie, don't be sad. And that's all. And now, he knew he wasn't coming back. And uh, so, Millie said, I, I couldn't be sad. If I'd been sad, I'd be disobedient. There's <laughs> another guardian. And he said, I mustn't be sad. So I wasn't sad. I'm not sad. I'm happy. Why shouldn't I be happy? There's Joey so Sandy. He's not now with Adam Hall, all his old friends, family, all his That's not who got on the ahead of us. And we're glad that we still have some Athenons left here. Beloved friends, allow them.